Negri in their recent work. And related to both questions, is that limit imposed by capitalism in any way determinative of how the struggle for socialism and a just radical democracy should proceed? Again, the shanty dwellers and the movements of the poor more generally seem to point us to exactly the argument McLaren and Muth want to emphasize, that the struggle for socialism is political and not determined in advance by pre-given interest. Indeed, to a large extent, that is the case. But following Rosa Luxemburg, whose work has become crucial to thinking about the so-called relationship between the first and second economy of South Africa, as well as the enclosure of the commons, the poor should be recognized as, as included in the logic of capitalism. Again, any adequate discussion of Luxembourg's contribution to current South African debates is beyond my short remarks here. But let me briefly summarize Luxembourg's central argument in the accumulation of capital. Her argument was that primitive accumulation is not a historical stage in capitalism, but inheres in the very logic of capitalism, and therefore the expropriation of the commons will be endless. It will last as long as capitalism does. Thus, under South African readings of Luxembourg, we would expect more and more of the commons or common goods to be appropriated by capital. Needless to say, South African natural resources, such as diamonds and gold, have long been appropriated by capital, indeed almost exhausted. But the point here is somewhat different, and I'm, I'm going to skip over Luxembourg to get to the, the central question, which is that Luxembourg just argues that this constant need for capital to create its own outside and then try to recontain it is one that inheres in the very logic of capital and therefore cannot be done away with. I want to turn to uh, the shanty dwellers' um, way of thinking about Luxembourg as it informs their service. Um, indeed, the shanty dwellers explicitly argue that they are not seeking a better service delivery or better forms of redistribution. They are seeking to reappropriate common goods such as electricity and water as belonging to all the people through their own appropriation uh, analysis. Now, Zizak with, and, and Leclau argued about whether there was something peculiar to the demand for the socialization of the means of production. In fact, Leclau actually says to Zizak that uh, he knows what Karl Marx means when he speaks about the overthrow of capitalism, but he doesn't know what Zizak means. Here is what the shanty dwellers mean by it. The shanty dwellers mean three things. First of all, there's the struggle now to create a, a, a common goods. Electricity, water, and other resources must be free. Shanty dwellers must not be evicted, and therefore there must be a movement now in Rosa Luxemburg's term to fight against all further enclosures and to make all natural resources belong to the people in, in common. Secondly, there is the question about the state and whether or not in Gramsci's sense it would be necessary to overthrow the ANC, or alternatively, since most of these people remain ANC members, to infiltrate it and bring it back to the uh, Freedom Charter with its articulation of the socialization of the means of production. Thirdly, how can the struggle for people's commons be turned into a much broader conception of something like the common quip? These are real questions that are asked on a day-to-day -day basis, questions raised by movements on the ground, and organic intellectuals are challenged to join with such movements in thinking about such questions. I know I have one more second. In moral images of freedom, I argued that we must dispel the fate of socialism as an impossible dream. There I wrote, we may not be able to tell grand stories that will guarantee the ultimate success of socialism, but it's precisely because we cannot tell such grand stories that doom it to failure, but leaves it up to us to make the truth of the ideal of something, socialism something that cannot be beaten out of this world. So my last question to both Chantel and Mouffe is, do you agree with me that socialism, even if understood within a project of radical democracy, must not be beaten out of our world if we are to have a radical change in the social relations worthy of our humanity? Thank you. join everybody else in uh, thanking uh, Jacques Lerza and the uh, organizers for uh, staging this wonderful event and for uh, me. Uh, it's, there's an, a disadvantage to going last among the, the five, which is uh, everybody has hit all the points. Uh, but the uh, advantage, I, I hope, is maybe the chance to sort of try to pull uh, together uh, a number of points that have already been made by other people. Um, 
for me too, um, hegemony and socialist strategy has a certain uh, biogra autobiographical uh, interest because um, I too, like several of the other speakers, am very much a child of the new left for whom the grappling with Marxism in the context of involvement in new left and uh, other new social movements uh, was central to my formation. And so um, this book um, certainly represented a kind of uh, summa, you could say, by 1985, of many uh, uh, doubts about Marxism uh, that were already quite widespread in my generation. Now, um, one could say that um, there, uh, it, it, it's worth thinking of it as a summa as opposed to a kind of avant-garde uh, intervention in this movement, uh, very much summing up a certain common sense of the time. But on the other hand, the specific way in which the book developed its argument and what it led to, I think, was very much a uh, highly original uh, intervention. One um, whose consequences, I think, require some scrutiny. So uh, Jacques Lerza introduced the session by um, suggesting that we can, uh, uh, that, that the book poses a kind of question. Okay, there's a, an essentialist Marxism, which is the target of the critique. And there is the post-Marxism that is espoused in the book. And the, all of the questions I want to raise um, have to do with the possibility of a third alternative, which would be another Marxism as opposed to post-Marxism. So um, let me start by um, mentioning, uh, first of all, this whole question of ontology. Uh, Robin Blackburn began by uh, reminding us of the labor metaphysics, which had been uh, so uh, central to uh, Marxism, to Orthodox Marxism, and indeed to many varieties of Western Marxism. And he reminded us that this, uh, this idea that uh, labor was in some sense the fundamental social stuff, it was the source of value, it was the uh, locus of the, the great wrong of capitalist society, namely exploitation. And it was um, also the, the possible lever of social transformation insofar as it uh, would provide the basis for uh, working class organizing. So the, the labor idea in, in Marxism performs many, many uh, functions. Now, um, the argument of hegemony and socialist strategy, it seems to me, uh, absolutely correctly right, demolishes that idea that there is a single concept like this that can simultaneously tell us what is real, what is the fundamental basis of power, and what is the necessary linchpin for social transformation. The question is, um, I, I find the book ambiguously hovering between sort of two ideas. One idea, which I think is the explicit uh, thesis and argument of the book, is that there is no substitute for the function that the category of labor plays in traditional Marxism, that that place must be empty, that the whole grammar of searching for any one such category is problematic. I think there's another um, sort of subordinate and possibly unintended strand in the argument, and that is that discourse itself is installed in, uh, if not exactly the same place, in something like that place. It is simultaneously sort of what is uh, most real, uh, and it is, uh, in, in a sense, the the locus of um, where power uh, congeals and can be challenged, and it is the lever uh, for possible social transformation. So uh, one question then is, um, 
what is the role that this category of discourse uh, plays in hegemony and socialist strategy? And, but my fear that it, um, that, the, that it ends up, despite their, the author's explicit aim of somehow reoccupying the place that uh, labor uh, occupied in traditional Marxism, leads to uh, a whole set of worries uh, that pick up phrases that others have used here having to do with discursive idealism and uh, so on. So I want to sort of reiterate and, and try to um, uh, focus that question. One could say something similar about the question of determinism. Um, there is um, a, at least a certain reading of Marx uh, probably not entirely uh, legitimate from my perspective, uh, but certainly within the orthodox Marxist tradition uh, that uh, this perspective uh, involves a, a deterministic conception on the relation certainly between uh, a group's structural position and society and the consciousness that is supposed to uh, develop uh, relatively automatically from that. Um, so, uh, really, uh, uh, understandably, correctly, persuasively, I, I think the most uh, really persuasive, uh, undeniable contribution of, of the book is the systematic um, dismantling of uh, any um, basis for, for any such uh, determinism and associated with their critique of class essentialism, the idea of a simple, a uh, unidirectional relation between social structure and consciousness. Now, um, what do they give us instead? Again, I think there's a, um, uh, there's a worry that um, what we really get is some kind of uh, flip side of determinism, some kind of if not absolute determinism, now absolute indeterminism. And so um, it, it now seems as if since everything is subject to discursive construction, reconstruction, articulation, rearticulation, um, it, uh, we, are, we have the impression that there are um, essentially no um, constraints at all on what is possible at the level of hegemonic articulation. So where is the attention to just such sort of nitty gritty things as uh, disparate power resources? Where is attention to such things as um, inherited uh, uh, traditions and schemas of interpretation which have weight? Uh, uh, for actors. Um, so what I, the question I want to pose here is do, do they really, how seriously do they really mean this uh, constant emphasis on indeterminism? And wouldn't we be better off with some uh, sort of other um, perspective which um, would be difficult to describe, but, but had, that had some kind of uh, just to take Marx's old phrase about men make their own history, but not of the whole cloth, something that captures that two-sidedness, that duality. Uh, call it a contextualized, uh, um, contextualized, hmm, what's the right word? Amalgam, that's not the, really the word I want, but of determinacy slash indeterminacy, something like that. Um, then, um, I want to say something then about the, the view of critique that emerges in this book. And again, let's start with, um, with traditional Marxism. And of course, there I see some of my students here, and as uh, we have been uh, going on and on for the last several weeks, and as others of you surely know in any case, um, there are certainly a number of different strands of critique in classical Marxism. Famously, the sort of exploitation critique that uh, Robin and I think uh, Drusilla uh, referred to, but also um, certainly the idea of a crisis critique, that the system is inherently uh, self-undermining and unstable. 
And that has often been thought, the crisis critique, to fall prey to this kind of determinism worry. It has been interpreted as a, a kind of having a kind of necessitarian quality that um, has uh, certainly in periods unlike ours where uh, it has proved uh, quite easy to displace uh, crisis tendencies into, uh, let's say, non-economic um, modes has seemed very, very doubtful. So this is all a, a, a kind of package of critique. And, and I think one could also mention a kind of grammar of life critique in Marxism in the sense of commodity fetishism, reification, that whole strand. OK. What's the picture of critique that emo emerges in hegemony and socialist strategy? Well. Um, it, it, it's an interesting question because there's undoubtedly a critique of metaphysical Marxism, but is there a critique of capitalist society? And if so, what does it look like? The most I can see is that there is a strong emphasis on what I would call dereification critique. That is, the sort of critique that shows, and this relates to Drusilla's point about that the political becomes central. The sort of critique that shows that everything that looks closed and fixed really uh, has a, a considerable openness and the potential for mutability and uh, for change. So um, I would say this uh, uh, appeal to openness against uh, reification is the sort of strongest um, strand uh, of their perspective that might suggest some kind of a critique. There is, in addition, um, I should say, um, certainly um, uh, several uh, important normative uh, notions uh, appear. Already? Ooh. All right. Certain <laughs> norm. I'll, I'll try to wrap up very quickly. Certain normative notions appear. There are, are obviously the appeal uh, to democracy, to radical and plural democracy, and to um, egalitarianism. Um, it, it's, I, I, I would, if I had more time, want to sort of pose the question of sort of how exactly Mouffe and Leclau, at least in this book, are kind of earned the title to the normative uh, notions that they uh, deploy. I sometimes feel that there's a, a, a certain kind of um, trying to have it both ways, right? Uh, using these uh, categories while um, also um, perhaps uh, dismantling the sort of normative theorizing that could um, actually um, uh, ground them. So um, to let me uh, let me conclude. What what? The general structure of the remarks that I wanted to make here was to sort of suggest, um, almost like imagine sort of three columns in a chart. Uh, the the left-hand uh, column I is traditional Marxism, and it gives a, right, a set of answers to the questions that I've posed. The middle column is hegemony and socialist strategy, which gives us uh, a set of alternatives. And the third column, would be the another Marxism uh, uh, column. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, fill that in. I don't uh, have time, and I probably couldn't do it even if I was given all the time in the world. But, uh, <laughs> um, but, but my worry is, uh, on the left column, that is the, um, the traditional Marxism column, for me, uh, and I suspect for many, many people, the target of critique in hegemony and socialist strategy either was at the time or soon became a straw man. I don't think that even in 1985 the problem uh, that was sort of inhibiting development of uh, um, better forms of Marxian and socialist, democratic socialist thought was the strong stranglehold of orthodox Marxism. So uh, th then on the second column, I think that there is a tendency in the book to give us uh, something that is a too simple reversal of that straw man column. And, and here's something I want to be very careful with, uh, and I want to uh, 
avoid any hint at all that, that I'm attributing what I'm about to say to Ernesto and Chantal. I am not. But um, I think that a certain reading of their book, um, which took the sort of discursive idealism or the tendency to discursive idealism, the tendency to indeterminism and, uh, and the tendency to center critique on dereification. I think this reading of the book has um, in some way has dovetailed very, very neatly with the common sense of neoliberalism. And I am, um, and, and I am, um, I'm con convinced that the sort of uh, project that uh, Drusilla and others have, uh, have outlined, which would be the need to reimagine uh, uh, democratic socialism for our time, will require uh, a, a renewed attention to aspects of critique that are not in this book and that have fallen by the wayside, above all the critique of political